Maya Douglas. Hello. Um, I don't know if everybody can see me, but everybody can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. So hi, I'm so happy to be here. I'm very excited. Um, I actually go by Maya K for my, my pen name. Um, and I went to Temple for undergrad. And I chose Arcadia because they didn't make me take the GRE. <laughs> um, um, but to be honest, when I saw that um, Arcadia was like in the top 25 on the East Coast um, for their master's programs, um, I was very excited to see that. And Dr. Wertheim was very open to um, accepting me. I think I just missed the GPA by like a little smidge. Um, and he just opened, you know, he just accepted me because they have like a conditional acceptance, like if you do good in these three courses. Um, so needless to say, um, the two years went by really, really fast. And um, I graduated from Temple in 07 with a BA in journalism. And then I have an MA in creative writing in English here. Um, and where I'm at today, I took this one class and it was called Writing for Children. And it literally just changed my life. Um, and I believe Miss Gretchen Hirsch still teaches here. Um, and I think she's a full-time staff member. But um, I took a Writing for Children's class and it literally, it made me realize that's exactly what I wanted to do. And when I was at Temple, I was a pre-med major. I was very confused. Um, and because you know, you, you feel like nobody wants to be a starving artist. Nobody wants to struggle. And I don't mind rejection. But um, nobody wants to struggle through the arts and to try to make it. And so I was kind of ignoring that thing that was like nudging in my gut. And that's kind of the theme that I have for tonight called The Blueprint. And, and I want to touch on that as well as discuss my work. Um, but ultimately, um, I just switched back to journalism. Um, I don't know what I was thinking, trying to be a journalism and a chemistry major, trying to enter pre-med and thinking that I would still have like the writing on the side. And eventually I just said, you can either be a super senior at Temple <laughs> or you can you know, graduate um, in a timely manner. So it took me about five years for undergrad and I got the BA in uh, journalism. My ultimate goal was to be the top editor at Essence Magazine. That was the original dream. Um, and it changed. I mean, Essence has gone through changes as far as being under um, Time Hurst. I think they're under Hurst. So that, that whole thing changed. Um, and they've gotten, their editors have like literally changed over the years. It used to be somebody there for like 10, 15, 20 years. Now I, I'd say every three years they have like this new uh, editor. But I found my passion in that class. And then I wrote my first book when uh, I started writing my first book, which is the, a song for Jordan, um, when my mother was diagnosed with tongue cancer. And I think anybody can imagine uh, the solace that was going on, like I was so alone. Um, I mean, she didn't have like the kind of cancer where we could talk, she couldn't talk. So I literally spent so much time by myself and I had started the book and I said, well, let me finish it. Um, and I did, I finished it. She was, she had cancer all the six weeks. I mean, God is really amazing. So, um, but we didn't know it was gonna be that short. I mean, I, I just thought that it was gonna be a long journey. Um, it went from, it went from stage three to, she's gonna be fine after we do this surgery. <laughs> so I was like, thank you, Lord. Um, oh yeah, it was stage four. And it was the most agonizing, eight hours of my life, <laughs> the surgery, uh, the doctor's checking in with me every hour. I'm like, stop calling me and focus on my mother, please. But I appreciated him, um, you know, letting me know how it was going because when you're under anesthesia that long, I mean, anything can go wrong. Um, but when I finished the song for Jordan, which tells the story of Jordan Crystal Myers, and she's a biracial teen girl who is a musician, and she's looking for her long lost father. And she knows that he's a musician. And it touches on the themes of racism. Um, the main reason why she doesn't know her father is because her grandparents, her mother is uh, Caucasian. And her grandparents didn't want her to have anything to do with him. Um, and so they kind of paid him to go away. And the story just kind of goes through the journey of a young girl, low self esteem, not knowing her worth. Um, you know, dealing with the different things that I think most young girls deal with today, not having a father in a household regardless. And I always say being a daddy's girl is a desire for most young girls, uh, regardless of race, social, economic status, it doesn't matter. 
um, I think it's 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 something that all young girls uh, really want. So that's where Jordan's character came from. Um, I'm most excited about that book. That was the third book that I released, but I'm most excited about that book because it is it has a movie to it. Um, I, I lived in Atlanta for two years, and I shot the movie in Atlanta. I was able to get a celebrity comedian and actor. He was in Medea's Big Happy Family, Rodney Perry. Um, he was the one whose wife kept chumping him, if y'all remember that. His wife kept talking real crazy to him, the, the heavy set lady. Uh, <laughs> right, so uh, he produced, he was in it and he produced it. Um, it also has a song to it. I, I have a best friend who's a rapper. And um, so it, that's part of the marketing that I kind of did. I put out the song um, before the book and then the book. Um, I was featured in the Chestnut Hill Local. Um, I was able to grab a little bit of, and I was also on Rodney Perry's uh, talk show. He's a blog talk radio uh, show. Um, the first book, Speechless Short Stories, this one is actually compiled of three, I think three stories that I had to turn in for Dr. Word Tom's class. <laughs> so I said, well, we're just gonna recycle those um, because I wanted to test it. I wanted to test this whole self-publishing thing on Kindle. You know, I didn't know, I feel like everybody's just putting up a book on Kindle, right? And not to knock it, but you know, it's like some of them are edited, right? So I said, well, I know that these three stories got an A, so they've been edited. They, you know, they're pretty good. And I wrote one more and I decided to put it together called Speechless because every story literally leaves you speechless at the end. And um, Terry J. Vaughn, who was in the Steve Harvey show, LaVita Alizé Jenkins. And, uh, I saw <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she ultimately became my big sister when I first, we met on Twitter and I interviewed, oh, wow. I interviewed her for my blog. And then she did her location, she opened up this actor's lounge called, called The Green Room. We, we talked about it in the interview and then ultimately when I moved to Atlanta, first place I went. It became like my artistic home. So she gave me my first book sign and we became very, very close. Um, I, I was able to meet so many people through her, people that worked at Tyler Perry Studios. Um, but my ultimate goal is, is to be a writer. I never wanted to be in front of the camera. I'm, I'm a boss, so I like to be behind the camera. I like to boss people around. And so, <laughs> and so you have to stay with your strengths. <laughs> so um, she gave me my first book signing, and it, I think that really made me, re in my first book review, and it really made me realize that you have to be able to open your mouth and ask for what you want. I just asked her to write the review. I knew she was busy. I knew she was on uh, Meet the Browns. And I was like, I need a review. And I know these two celebrities, and I'm going to ask them for a review. And I think so many people was just like, how did you do it? And I was just, I just asked. All she could do was say no. <laughs> you know, I, I could touch her. She could touch me. She's human. You know, she's not like, um, you know. And, and I think it, it all comes down to you just, how, how bad do you want what you're asking for? Um, and so this was actually the first book, and it came out June 6, 2012. Um, her and Rodney did my reviews for that, and I generally just use their reviews for all of my marketing. Um, and then Butterfly Faith is the one that came out May 2014. It's my first romance novella, and I'm excited about that because I'm now signed with Royalty Publishing House, which is a, an independent... Um, it's a black-owned publisher, independent, but she has close to 60 authors. Amazing, amazing woman, um, and she's really, really holding it down in the independent publishing space. Um, I, for a song for Jordan, I must have got rejected like 100 times, but I did get requested by one agent, and when you get somebody that says, I'll read it, you're like, oh my God, finally. And that's still not even, you're not even breaking any real, uh, that's breaking the ice, but I mean, People think that agents just want to say no, but they get rejected too because once, if she was to represent me and then she takes it to all these editors at the publisher, they can say no too. And at the end of the day, it doesn't speak to your talent. It's just like, maybe that's not selling right now or maybe we just aren't able to market and maybe they're just not looking for that right now. So after getting constant rejection, that's when I just decided to go ahead and and release these. Um, and to be honest, I'm a hustler. I'm from North Philly. I think I do better out the back of my trunk than in, <laughs> in stores and on Kindle. And I'm just being honest. I have been able to sell more books out my trunk than, and I think that's where you start. Anybody, whether you have t-shirts or you have makeup, you sell Mary Kay, you know, you got, my mom sells Avon. And I think that's when I got the first entrepreneurial bug. Uh, I remember taking some of her Avon books to my middle school. I went to Amy Six, and I was uh, asking my friends, I was like, buy some of my mom stuff. <laughs> and, I, and I literally was able to make some sales. So 
I've been working since I was 12. I was making $4 an hour. It was actually at an Avon office in Chestnut Hill. I was uh, putting the ladies' uh, address labels on the back of the books, and that was my first job. And I've been working ever since. My dream is to retire at 40. 31, okay, I got nine years. Okay. <laughs> so, so today, um, being signed with Royalty Publishing House, I didn't sign with the independent publisher because I, I was tired of getting rejected, to be honest. Um, it's hard to be the writer, the editor, the designer, the marketer. You're everything when you self-publish. You and, and by the time it was time to write again, I would be exhausted, like mentally exhausted, because I had to do all of that for this book. And now it's time to write another book, and I'm just like, I'm tired. So I was just looking for someone who would help me in the area of, you handle the cover, you handle the editing, I can focus on writing. And that's what she did. I signed with her August 31st, and my book is coming out next Saturday. That's really quick. Um, and I'm almost halfway done the second book. Like, that, that, it allows me to just write like crazy and focus. Um, and I'm actually glad that I signed with the independent publisher. I think what my one piece of advice from that would be don't resist or reject a blessing because it's not packaged the way you expect. And big doesn't mean better. So everybody, I, I wanted to be with Simon & Schuster. I wanted to be with Random House, and I still do. I still do, guys, so if you're looking for another writer. But I think when you think about the digital platform that most independent publishers are geared towards, that digital platform is really um, really allowing people to become entrepreneurs in their own right. Not just the publisher, but the, the authors. Um, you, you might pay the publisher a percentage, but you really kind of have control, more control than you would have if you were at a Simon & Schuster, a Random House, a uh, Penguin, or anything like that. Uh, but I still have the dream of going there simply because we all know what that means. That means no, not, you're not really struggling to get into the bookstores now. But where are all the bookstores? They're online. There's, they close borders. They, I mean, it's just Barnes & Noble when you really think about it. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited to be with royalty and to have someone who has my back. I don't know how she does it. She has, I think, a five-year-old. Uh, he might be a couple years older, and she's always available. She has 60-something authors, and she never not, doesn't answer her phone. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> she's never rushing you off the phone. Um, she's always answering emails. And I think that that's great because I can't say I would get the same thing at a big house. I can't say, I know people sign with Simon & Schuster, and I can't say that they're able to say this person is answering, you know, that they have that connection. Um, they might have to wait days or weeks. And that's not to knock it, I think there's a level for that, and I think um, that that's good. I, th I think that's good to an extent because you have to want to market your work more than you expect the publisher to. So, um, so having three books out now, I'm very excited about Concrete Stilettos. Let me explain. <laughs> what is it? So Concrete Stilettos, um, it's called Concrete Stilettos, A Love Story is the subtitle. That comes out next Saturday on Kindle. And then the print version, which I have pre-order forms for, comes out um, on the 30th of, uh, did I say November? Okay, okay, I'm sorry, I thought I felt like, October, October, I just want to make sure I'm saying October. So October 17th is digital and October 30th is the print. Um, and I remember when I did a book signing at Barnes & Noble uh, in Atlanta, and I remember getting a no from Barnes & Noble. They had this process, you're supposed to go through corporate, and then corporate will let you know if you can go to the bookstores. And corporate told me no, and I said whatever. And I went into the bookstore and I showed the girl my book and, well, the manager, and she had said no too at first because I published through CreateSpace. CreateSpace doesn't have a system where you can return the books. And bookstores want to be able to return a book if a customer returns it. So it's very hard when you don't have that. CreateSpace is under Amazon, but they don't have like a warehouse where they keep them. It's print on demand. So I've never been an author who has like a thousand books. I order them as they come in, which is good. It keeps my cost low. But the downside to that is now Barnes & Noble is like, we don't want your book. We can't return it. But I'm like, it's too good. They're not going to return it. So eventually, eventually, um, I think when she saw the cover and she saw how much I had put into it, she changed her mind and I got a yes. And I think me going there changed the whole tone from emails and phone calls. 
because, yeah, she was nice over the phone, but I think she's just like, this girl's not gonna leave me alone, so I might as well say yes and let her, you know, come and present her books, and it was me and four other authors, and it was very exciting. I think I took like 20 books, and I might have, I sold like 12, so that was exciting for me. I mean, it's, it's very exciting, um, and I forgot to present the percentage that comes out of it, but I, I made out pretty good. I made out pretty good. And I remember the manager saying, the other manager, like the top manager, he said, what are you working on next? And I said, it's this book about a girl, she's a stripper, and <laughs> and I'm like, his eye goes, okay? And I said, no, but it's not that kind of story. I said, she's actually a virgin. And she's a stripper because you know her parents were murdered when she was 12, and she's just kind of looking for her identity. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that some people try things just because they want to try them. Not everybody comes from a broken home. Not everybody's you know broken into pieces. Some people just want to try something. Um, and some people actually don't think there's anything wrong with tripping. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not one of those things where it's, it's okay or it's not okay. I think, I think before you judge, you should know someone's story. So, this young lady is, uh, she's 16 when she starts, but obviously she's moonlighting as 18. She lies, she gets a fake ID, she gets into the club. And the whole, the whole thing is her journey back to God. And I it's, it's a controversial urban romance novel, it is, because I touch on how the church can be very judgmental towards today's generation. Um, it's, it's a lot of people that I came up in the church with who are no longer there because of judgment. And I think that this is a topic that needs to be discussed. And I love pinning stories that provoke dialogue. Um, I love pinning stories that will make a young girl look at something and say, okay, I don't wanna live that life anymore, I can live this life. And so the whole, the book is about her journey back to God. She knows that God's calling her name. She knows that God is kind of reaching out to her. Um, and she's just trying to, she, she knows it's time for her to get out the life. So it's all about pleasure and purpose colliding and her finding herself. Um, and I, it's probably one of my greatest characters to date. Um, her name is Taz Green and I don't even know where I came up with Taz. <laughs> no, I do know. My, I was a nanny in, in, in Georgia, and one of the twins that I was nannying for, one of them came and said, my gymnastic teacher is so cute, and his name is Taz, and I just wrote it down. And I, I gave my character, it's a girl character, but I like it. I think it's fresh, I think it's funky, and I think it's different. Um, so I would have to say Taz is the most like me. I never stripped, but she is most like me in going through Going through different challenges in life, going through different challenges in life, and trying to find herself in, in knowing that God is calling her name. So um, that's kind of what I wanted to touch on with my books. But I do want to touch on. I don't know if I want to say in closing, but when I thought about tonight, I thought about what could I say. I'm not here to promote just my books or my business or myself. I want to. I want people to walk away saying, wow, like she kind of inspired me. She left this nugget. I want you to buy the book too, but um, <laughs> it, it, I'm like, if you could just walk away with something. So my, my head, the wheel started turning and I was just like, what, what can I say? What can I, what can I do? And, and I prayed about it and, and I just heard something say, you know, the blueprint. And then I went and listened to Jay-Z's blueprint. Don't ask me why. And I was just like, what does that mean, though? Like, why would, why would God drop that in my spirit? What does the blueprint, blueprint mean for this speaking engagement? And I work at the Constitution Center as a security officer. I don't know if I want to say that on camera. As a security officer. And our CEO um, is, is he's a former lawyer. He's still a lawyer, and he does, like, a lot of different things. And I remember him asking me, like, well, what are you going to speak about on Thursday? They, they opened a new exhibit uh, at the Constitution Center, so they always have this big event for members to come and see the exhibit before anybody else. And so he's asking me, and I'm looking at him like, what you mean? I'm just presenting my books. Like, <laughs> what you mean what I'm gonna talk about? But I was like, actually, I know what I wanna talk about. I'm gonna talk about passion and purpose and how to listen to your gut instinct and how not to spend eight years in college because you're trying to do something your parents want you to do when you wanna do something else. And so the blueprint for me I don't know. You guys are laughing. I have to ask you why. Having that same conversation. Yes. So, the blueprint for me is, you know, I, I think we all are architects of our own lives, right? And obviously, we know that. I, I'm, again, this isn't like a religious speech, but obviously, we know God has the final say, regardless of what God you choose to serve, right? And so, we know that He probably is the ultimate architect. But the blueprint for me is just, I feel like there are so many people out there lost, no matter how old they are. And, I, and, and it kind of pains me 
to meet someone much older than me, 40s, 50s, and, and they, they just set, never seem to have found what they were placed here on earth for. So for me, the blueprint, I launched the nail polish line August 1st. Um, I'm wearing, and it's, it's, it's handmade, and it's very tedious. And I remember looking up at my blueprint. My blueprint is a vision board, and it's a vision board that I created. I do it every year. And I looked at the vision board, and I, I said, oh my gosh, the nail polish line is no longer on the board. It's in front of me. And so I put it up there like two years ago. I got the idea when I was living in Korea. I taught English in Korea for a year. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like the dreams are manifesting. It's, it's like really coming alive. So that's what the blueprint is. I, I believe that if you feel something deep down inside of you, I remember being five and asking this girl in my class if she would accept a quarter for every picture I needed her to draw for my first book. I, and she looked at me like, she was like, I am not about to be your artist for this book that you claim you write. And, and I ignored it. I was five years old and I ignored it. I was like, that, that doesn't mean anything. I might write books on the side. And I decided I was going to do you know, nursing or pre-med. And people would always ask me, well, you want to be a pediatrician? Yeah, something like that. And all of that time, time is never wasted. You, you can make it work. But all of that time, I was chasing something that didn't even want me. That makes sense. So when I say the blueprint as a theme and as a focus for tonight, my whole thing is, do you have a blueprint for your life? Do, are you mapping things out? Are you, do you have a vision? Are you taking things off the vision board and literally making them come to life? Are you setting down systems? I love goals, but I love systems even more. I think when you have a goal, you can kind of, it, it could be a little flimsy, but if you have a system, I think you're a little bit more disciplined. So for instance, my goal used to be to write 2,000 words a day. Now my system is to write 10,000 words a week. So that means if I don't write Monday and Tuesday, as long as I get those 10,000 words done, my system has been fulfilled. So I'm more focused on systems now than I am goals. So my system is to build an empire where I can go back to North Philadelphia, where I'm from, and help the the children in the community, to retire my mother in the next five years, and to never have to work again. <laughs> and to never have to work ever again after the age of 40. My system is, you know, I mean, of course it's a goal as well, but in, in that system, how do I do that? How am I building an empire? Well, I have the nail polish line, I have the writing coaching agency, I'm an author, and just the old, all the little things that I do in between. And so I want to encourage everybody to kind of create a blueprint. Um, that, that mapping out, that writing, that journaling, that, you know, writing things down. And when they say when you write it down, it gets real, it does. <laughs> it gets real when you write it down. When you say it, it's not as real. When you tell a friend, it's not as real. But when you actually write it down and you give yourself a deadline, I think it, 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 it kind of pushes you to get it done. And you're going to fail. I think failure is your best friend when you want to be an entrepreneur or whatever, whatever you want to be. Um, you're going to fail. <laughs> and I think failing is important. Um, I think about all the people who talked about failing, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all the times that they failed, Barack Obama. And I think that it's so important to fail because in that way, I think it keeps you humble. Um, I think anybody who creates a business the first time and it, it's successful, I'm not sure I want to deal with that business. <laughs> um, I think you pushing through and learning what went wrong and fixing the kinks and ironing it all out, I think that's what makes a business owner. And so I just want to provoke you to think about your blueprint. You know, what is your blueprint in life? And if you're trying to figure out what your passion and purpose is, you know, what's, what's, what's kind of hitting that stomach when you go to sleep. I literally go to sleep thinking about Taz every night. I ain't never met, well I met her, but I, you know, she's a character. But that's what keeps me up at night. That's what wakes me up in the morning, is my characters. And, and the idea that one day I'll be in Hollywood writing and creating films and writing and creating TV shows, and that's what keeps me going. So, you know, all together, no matter how many times I, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, I thought I wanted to be a nurse, or be in the medical field in some way. I think ultimately what, what kept drawing me back was this thing where I was gonna be a writer. And I remember saying I was gonna write a book and I told my professor, I think it was in 05, and I was at Temple when he was pulling each student out of the class. He wanted them to say like a little bit about themselves. And I was like, I'm writing a book. I hadn't even started this book. And I'm telling him I'm writing a book. Every time somebody went, oh, I'm writing a book, I'm writing a book. I didn't start writing that book until 
what was that, 2011 when she, <laughs> she was diagnosed. So I, I, I feel like I always knew, but I was very scared. I was scared of what, what I felt my family if I wasn't this doctor that I claimed I wanted to be. What I felt myself if I ended up not making any kind of money from, you know, trying to be something else. Like what I felt, period. And then I, I started to understand that I would only be failing myself if I didn't follow my heart. I would only be failing my family if I was trying to be something that they wanted me, to, not that they wanted me to be, but just to keep, to save face. You know, oh, I wanted to be a doctor, so I'm gonna go ahead and be a doctor, and I'm gonna be able to say I'm the first doctor in the family. Um, but at least I'm able, I am able to say, you know, I'm the first author in my family. You know, I think, I'm not sure, mom, but I think I'm the first person who um, has had a speaking engagement. I'm the first person that taught English in Korea, who lived in another country. Um, and so I'm excited that I followed my blueprint and that I trusted my blueprint. And I hope that you all are doing the same. Thank you, Maya. Thank you.